Hello, everyone. Welcome to Blue Innovation Doc. We are on day eight of, the, uh, of our sessions. And uh, so far, we've had some amazing panelists and some, some heated discussions here on the stage, but also um, we've made a lot of progress. I want to welcome our panelists, our audience, and if anyone's walking around and wants to hear this discussion, it's very interesting because we have, we have uh, here we have a combination of, of C advocates and talking to the industry, to industry experts. Uh, I also want to welcome all our online viewers. So just to let you know that there's a lot of people just also watching from home. So it's, uh, and this is being recorded. So if, if you want to uh, look back or if you don't have time to stay, you can always look back and see all the discussions. Uh, my name is Anouk Grun. I, I'll, I'm your moderator today. And I'm actually from the design industry. Work, I've worked in, um, in motorcycles and in um, snowmobiles, so kind of products related to the industry, lifestyle products. Um, so I do have a, a passion for product design, for cool products, but I do think they should be made sustainably. Um, so what I would like to do is uh, introduce the, panels, the panelists to the stage. And I would our first like to welcome Frank Schweikert. He is from, he's the founder of the German Ocean Foundation. Welcome. If well, you want, you can sit yeah. there, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Founder, wow. Uh, and uh, Vanessa George, uh, she is the uh, International Corporate Part Partnership Manager of the Sea Cleaners. Welcome. We also have Mike Obrook, he's the Vice Chair of. Should we um, yes, yeah. The name is because it's spelled differently. <laughs> Else. No, no, you're the name of your company. Elas Motion. Elas Motion, as in uh, it's a play on o the word ocean. <laughs> and um, yes, yeah, so he is uh, focusing on biodiversity and climate change. Uh, then I'd like to welcome David F Fentner. <laughs> he is policy officer for Marine Litter for the, for the German <laughs> Conservation Union. Welcome. Then we have somebody more from the industry. Sorry. Renata, Renata Marovic. She is manager of uh, the Marina Punat in Croatia. Welcome. <laughs> and we also, have, we also have Jorge Bunk. He's managing director of the... Uh, German Marine Association, Bunk in Bunk Bremen. Welcome. I think you're going to get all the hard questions. Yes. And uh, and finally, we have our expert professor, Dr. Franz Brumer, from the University of Stuttgart. He's head of research in biodiversity and scientific dyeing institute for biomaterials. Welcome. Hello. Yeah. So I think this is. Uh, I think this is really almost the first panel where we also have people that are sort of directly um, sort of would be fighting head to head in kind of in that situation because before we had a lot of people that were from similar directions so that's kind of interesting. What I'd like to do is um, I'd like to start with uh, Franz if that's okay. If you could just take, we're good, we'll do each of us two minutes, just um, tell us like introduce yourself, who you are, a little bit of your background, and if you have been to the show, what your first impressions are so far. Yeah, thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel. Uh, I'm a biologist and, uh, and I was on a volunteering base uh, more than 20 years involved in the German Diving Federation, uh, 16 years as the president. And uh, the first impression, uh, it's good, the boat is back. And the people are here, so we are really happy in Hall 12. And my professional background in Stuttgart at the university, we are trying to combine research on biodiversity with scientific diving. So we are looking and monitoring what's going on under the water, below the surface, 
And uh, in this case, we are coming in touch, for example, with alien species, which could be transported by boating, by biofouling. So this is the context also, why I'm, I think, why I'm here today on the panel. What was the last thing you said? Um, species that are being transported to the wrong areas? Is that what you're talking about? Or? Right, the species transported to the non-native places, yeah. and then they have a, quite a great impact to the biodiversity or to the ecosystems. Yeah, okay. And did you mentioned you have a stand at, at yes. the show? Where we is it? We, uh, in Hall 12, F40. Okay. Yeah. And it's called... It's, it's for the University it's of Stuttgart. It's for the Stuttgart. university. We are here for a European project on scientific diving, science diver. And we had on Wednesday, we had a workshop in Hall 14 together with Frank. So uh, this is where we are promoting scientific diving. And uh, I think we can talk a little bit later on this topic. And there's a great interest from young people, students, for this combination to do something. As a study. Uh, as I said already, by okay. biodiversity. Okay, good. And we are in the middle of a biodiversity, biodiversity crisis, so yeah. that's what they are interested in. Yeah. And uh, maybe one word uh, to the university. We are now have the first students coming from Friday for Futures, and it's really impressive. Okay, yeah, well, we'll talk about that some more. Uh, then I would like to... Um, ah, Renata, you're sitting... <laughs> You guys switched places, that's okay. Renata, uh, could you uh, also tell us about uh, you, where you came from, and uh, the background? Yes, I'm happy to greet you here in Düsseldorf. Uh, I'm uh, Renata Marevic, the manager of Marina Punat. It's the oldest marina in Croatia and in that part of the Adriatic. Uh, we have uh, uh, almost 1,500 boats in, in our yacht, in our marina. Uh, almost 1,000 uh, in the sea and the rest uh, on, uh, in the dry marinas. And yes, a lot of experience, uh, a lot of happy customers that are staying in our marina, uh, not only for a few years, but even for decades uh, and a few generations uh, of customers actually raised uh, in, in our uh, city, Punat, on our island, who learned to swim there and uh, who are happy to come back even with their children and grandchildren. Uh, we employ approximately 150 um, employees in our uh, Marina Punat group, uh, which also has a, a big uh, shipyard, uh, not for shipbuilding anymore. Uh, it was famous for uh, uh, building uh, wooden ships, but uh, unfortunately nobody uh, is dealing with wooden ships uh, in common today. Uh, but we do a lot uh, in a refit and repair and maintaining and uh, trying to uh, provide everything that uh, a customer needs, uh, not only for his boats, but also uh, for uh, his pleasure. We have also a hotel in our group uh, and bungalows, a small hotel and beautiful bungalows uh, surrounded by almost 600 olive trees. And uh, yeah, we are uh, happy to be in this uh, boating industry, uh, which is really a special kind of uh, tourism, uh, making people happy, and it's really nice to, to work in this industry. Thank you, thank you. Do you, are, do you have a stand here or not? Yes, uh, we are coming to Düsseldorf uh, for more than um, 15 years with our own stand. It's in the hall 13, uh, B32. Uh, but uh, since we are very... Um, a marina which, with such a long uh, year since founding. We are coming to visit uh, this boat show uh, for more than 30 years. So okay. we are happy, very happy to be uh, in boat, at Boat Düsseldorf again yeah. after this break of two years. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah well, welcome back. Okay, so Thank Jorge, you. <laughs> uh, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, I'm Jörg Bunke. I'm uh, the managing director of Book Bremen. Um, uh, Book Bremen is a distributor, a wholesaler of all kind of technical uh, products uh, around the boat. Yeah, so from A to Z, mainly leisure boats, but also commercial boats. Uh, so we represent roughly 50 different suppliers 
uh, of uh, products uh, for, for, uh, for boating. Um, uh, I originally come from a completely different business. I have 20 years of experience with OEM business in automotive and OEM business uh, in aerospace. And at some point of time, I thought, well, it could be a good idea to have a look to, to some other industries, which I, uh, so I changed three years ago. Um, we also have a booth here in, uh, in this hall uh, at uh, booth number uh, C40. It's just in the center of this hall here. And we are also here since years and years, I cannot remember. But it's also the first booth uh, or the first uh, exhibition for, for myself. Okay, but but what what attracted you to switch from automotive to marine? Uh, if if you would have been in 20 years in automotive business, you uh, the answer would be very simple for you to understand. Yeah, because there's a lot of pressure to suppliers and. Uh, when I started in the mid of the 90s, uh, uh, um, nearly 30 years ago in, in automotive, it was more or less also very familiar, or uh, family, very, uh, very friendly, but there was a lot of pressure the last years especially. So I, therefore I said, well, I have looked at these different uh, industries. Uh, now I will see uh, and find out uh, what is about uh, the, what about the the boating uh, industry and and actually this is really different to what are all I have experienced before. Are you also a boater? Yes, I okay. have a boat, uh, an old boat, okay. uh, uh, in the Netherlands. Oh. Okay, good. All right, thank you, David. Yeah, hello. Um, Thanks for having me. I'm David Fender, working for NABU here in Germany, focusing on the North Sea and Baltic Sea. And I'm a um, policy advisor on marine litter, um, working in this field for more than 10 years, um, starting in Berlin, in Berlin with an international conference on marine litter, um, working on this field, working in that time for whale and dolphin conservation, um, focusing directly on the pressure of marine litter for those um, animals. And um, so from, from, from the start, I, was, I, I am a marine biologist. I started, studied as a master in marine biology um, and worked since then mainly in NGOs trying to protect the, the ocean, um, working in Chile, South America, in Manila, in the Philippines, also in Brussels. Um, and now, since two and a half years, just before the coronavirus hit us all, um, starting with uh, NABU, and therefore it's also my first time at the boat, and it's pretty interesting to exchange so many ideas and um, how to work together, how to um, bring solutions um, into, into place and fight marine litter. Yeah, yeah thank you. I'm very curious what you, what, what you, um, what you discovered. But we'll, uh, we'll get back to that. Mike? My name is Mike Oburg. Uh, I have nearly 13 years experience with shark protection and uh, I'm the vice chair for Elas Motion, it's a German NGO. And the main thing what we are doing is uh, that we would like to protect sharks and the sea. And uh, because the main thing is you could not really protect sharks without protecting the sea. Uh, what we are doing is we are translating science uh, to the people that everybody recognize and understand what uh, science, Scientologists uh, are, are doing. So, and the next very important thing is we are going to schools. That means we are make training that our children can learn a lot about the sea, about the things what happens in the sea. For example, plastic in the sea and so on. And, and uh, we have, for example, last year nearly 1,000 children make to uh, um, to, to undersea. Um, I didn't find the right word to. Uh, uh, 
protection. What, what did the children do? Did you let them die, or what did? Yes, we, we are doing with the children some some projects. No? That means we, we we pick up the children and said, okay, take a look to uh, to the, to the to the animals in the sea, which kind of animals we have, and and how is the pyramid of uh, of eating each other. And after that, we are talking about sharks, no? the behavior of the sharks, and last but not least about the consumption of waste in the water, yeah, and what does it mean for the sea. Yeah. Okay. So you've been swimming with sharks? Yes, yes, I'm used, I'm used to do alive. that. still alive? Yes, I'm used to do that. Yeah. Okay, but I guess that's also a way to become more familiar and more, have more empathy when you're with the animals. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, no, it's, it's fine to go diving with sharks. No? Um, it's, as you can see, everything is <laughs> okay still, with me. You're still in no, one piece. Nothing lost. And uh, so it's only the way you are doing go, or go diving with the sharks. No? You, have a, you must have a very clear behavior with the, with the animals. And so it's, everything is okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, Vanessa? Yeah, thank you, Anouk. And also thank you, AVI, for having us, being part of this panel discussion. Um, so I'm originally from the private sector, actually, um, mainly focusing on la the lifestyle sector and even luxury goods. Um, and due to the pretty obvious environmental issues that we have at the current stage, uh, I decided to change and be part now of the Sea Cleaners that is focused on ocean protection, especially when it comes to plastic pollution. Uh, so we have a really holistic approach when it comes to our missions. Um, we, um, we focus, for example, on collecting and managing plastic waste on land and at sea. Um, but also to, we do also awareness raising, prog um, uh, awareness raising programs to fight the issue really at its source. Um, we work on scientific studies as well to better understand marine plastic pollution. Um, and I'm really excited to be part of BOAT. It is also my first time uh, this year. I'm, an, I'm excited to see, to have um, the opportunity to speak here. I think I've seen there ha have been a lot of great panel discussions here at the Blue Innovation Dock. So I'm really excited to see so diverse um, innovations and solution that the boating industry is working on. I'm also really excited about the Love Your Ocean stand. Um, we are also part of this particular stand with the model of the so-called Manta, our, um, our main project that we are working on right now, which is going to be a gigantic green and smart ship. Okay. So Sea Cleaners also has a stand? Or are you in? We are part of together. the Love Your Ocean and stand. And where is, th where is that? It is in Hall 14. Hall 14. Okay. Yes. Good. Thank you. So Frank? Yeah, thanks, uh, Anouk, and thanks for this kind invitation and for the um, uh, approach to have sustainability here in the middle of this uh, fair boat show. I'm here since uh, 32 years. Basically, I'm a journalist and a biologist, and I'm the founder of the German Ocean Foundation, and I'm running a private research vessel since uh, 30 years now called Aldebaran. And we did, a, we did a lot of projects in the Mediterranean, in the North Sea, Baltic Sea, in the Caribbean. And um, our main task of the foundation is to communicate about sustainability. And we are very happy about the decision of the boat Düsseldorf to have this Love Your Ocean initiative. We have at the moment uh, around 100 partners from all over the world for sustainability, 50 on the stage and 50 on the booth. So you have um, workshops, you have exhibitions, you, we have a large area for sound in the sea, so you can really look for everything. Also for plastics and plankton with uh, very uh, high-grade microscopes and things like this and scientists. So we want to start the way for sustainability and I think the, we are in a huge transformation time right now and um, we feel that all the customers and also the industry, so congratulations to a lot of um, partners from industry, are really uh, pushing for sustainability so this is the right place to start this discussion now. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. And just a question, how, how many years has Love Your Ocean been at this show? Um, this is now the sixth year the sixth year okay. of Love Your Ocean, and um, it's really huge. So it's 700 square meters, 50 partners, and I would love to invite everybody of you also online, come to Boat Düsseldorf, hall number 14, is entrance east, yeah. and it's in the middle, it's a, a big inflatable whale, so you can't miss it. Can, okay, <laughs> big inflatable whale. Okay, cool, thank you. All right, so we will start with, uh, with our questions, and I think I'll start with you, Professor. Um, your question is, do you see an increase in students for the diving um, tech biology program at, at Stuttgart University, and um, what will, if you do that study, what will you then be able to do to help or with, your, with the research or with the, the work that you will then do? As I already mentioned, um, with our young people coming for the first time now from Friday for Futures, there are really a, a great interest on these problems, on this crisis. And uh, the technical biology study at the University of Stuttgart is a unique program combining biology, natural science with technology. So uh, we are in a good collaboration with the engineers, with uh, the biophysics departments. So um, in combination then with uh, scientific diving, we are really close to uh, the problems of the sea and not only of the sea, but also of the freshwater systems. Uh, if you look for the SDGs, uh, there is only uh, life below water. Um, and uh, we are trying to don't forget the freshwater systems. And uh, I would like to mention that we have a good collaboration with Aldebaran. Uh, and uh, he's not only at the sea, he's, only, uh, he's also on the Lake Constance every year. And uh, so the interest is there, and uh, we have indeed to change our uh, learning topics with the, the teaching topics. Uh, and this is indeed biodiversity, biodiversity crisis, biodiversity loss. And what are the reasons for that? And the students are really interested not to hear only the problems, but only also do something for the solutions of these problems. So. Um, uh, my colleagues here on this panel have mentioned the um, plastics uh, problems, micro, macroplastic, and we try to convince the students that it is not really possible to collect the microplastic if it is already in the sea, in the lake. So we have to try to get uh, solutions not to bring microplastics into the lakes, into the water systems, and therefore we have uh, a new topic in my uh, research group, and this is microplastic in sports. Yeah. For example, artificial turf systems with the infill of microplastic. So this is what we are really are doing in our research, and we ha have uh, at the moment five uh, master theses running on this topic. Okay, so that's really tackling one product that should change. Yes, okay. and the microplastic, it doesn't matter if it's come from sports or it come from boats or something from the synthetic, it doesn't matter. It's microplastic it's in the, the water system is, uh, it's really a, a huge problem. So, so basically, since I'm, of course, what you're saying is that all the microplastics that are now in the water cannot be removed. There's no That's technology yet to do that. I'm convinced on that. Okay. If it is in the system, we cannot collect everything and get it out. So the only way to get rid of it is to stop putting it in. Right. Okay. Yeah. And the ocean, the ocean starts directly at your home, yeah. at home. It starts not at the coast. Yeah. The ocean in the topic of microplastic starts at the product, uh, the company, at the university, directly in front of your home. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, um, then I would like, uh, Jorge, your question is, um, how can companies integrate sustainability into their product range? What, what would you advise? Or Yeah, I, I think the, the, the 
the question is a little bit difficult to answer because, uh, first of all, you have to have products which are sustainability, uh, sustainable. And, and the f question is, what does, uh, how, how, uh, what's the matter to, uh, for, for industries to make sustainable products? And uh, I think there are mainly three triggers on that. Uh, one trigger, of course, this is always what we uh, realize in in day-to-day -day, uh, news is uh, politics, of course. Yeah. So you have uh, very simple. You have uh, EU uh, regulations on pollution and so on. So industries make their cars cleaner. So this is very popular, everybody knows about this. In, um, in boating, very similar approach is, uh, let's say, the uh, biocide uh, uh, discussion about uh, anti-foulings and uh, um, uh, sustainable coatings uh, on ships. Yeah? So this is very similar. Uh, but uh, this is politics on the one side. On the other side, the question is everything which is, let's say, uh, driven uh, internally, either driven by, by the industries themselves or driven by the end users because they demand this, the question will always be how can the industry make money out of this? Because if they don't make money with that, they will not change. There is no reason to change. They, can, they will only change if they will be forced to change by politics. So the uh, question is how can they change, how can they find products which are more sustainable and, uh, uh, and, and give an advantage also to the environment uh, at the same time. Yeah. So there are there are a few uh, uh, there are a few examples uh, uh, I, I could bring. There are let's say uh, uh, developments uh, in that area that uh, uh, in industries or sub man manufacturers think of let's say being products more modular, more sustainable in that way that you if the product breaks uh, it will not. You don't have to throw it all away, but you can exchange parts, so better repair than replace. Yeah, so there are ways, but it's coming really, really slow. And uh, as long as customers or end users agree that, that uh, this is the offer to them, then uh, the change in industry will also be very, very slow. Yeah. Just like since you are in contact with all these companies that are producing product and not always sustainably, do any of them do any of them say to you, "We'd like to change, but we can't," or are any of them? I mean, or do, or do they not care? Or yeah, I think that's that's the that's the discussion between NGOs uh, about in, uh, uh, between industry about uh, between uh, end users and so on. And I think there is too less communication between them. Yeah, so I think there would be uh, uh, there, there can be more efforts to find products or to find processes to improve the situation. Yeah, but, but, but currently, why, why should they change? Because it's easy, easy doing if, if everything runs smooth and well as in the past. So where's the need? Where's the need? That's, that's the big problem. Well, that you kind of wonder, do they have a conscience? But, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe we can make them feel guilty today. OK, thank you. Renata, uh, I just need to put on my glasses. Your question is, uh, what are some ways now and in the future to make your marina more sustainable? Since you are actually you know, one of the people who is providing the, the services from the industry. Yes, uh, I think uh, marinas and ports can do a lot uh, in a way to run their business more sustainable and uh, resilient. And I think we already are doing a really big effort. Uh, first of all, our customers are, uh, they have a great level of awareness uh, that uh, they like to be in the nature, in the base, and, and they like to keep it clean 
and uh, to impact uh, the, the environmental as less as they could. Uh, what marinas can do and actually are doing, I can tell you, for instance, for an example, what we are doing in our six decades uh, long uh, business um, and by so many boats. Uh, first of all, uh, we can do a lot uh, in uh, using in, in the planning and constructing uh, marinas and ports. Uh, it's, uh, it's very important to use technologies and uh, products uh, that can, uh, uh, for instance, uh, um, um, avoid the, uh, the raining water coming from the marina premises with oils getting into the sea directly. They can and they should uh, put uh, filters and separators, what we are doing. Along the shore, we have everything covered with uh, filters and separators, so in the sea only ends clean water. This is, uh, as uh, my colleague here said, uh, preventing is the best and the only way to, to uh, reduce the impact on the environmental in this industry. We will not stop going boating, uh, but we have to behave uh, properly. Uh, so not only in technology and construction uh, and using of infrastructure that helps us to keep uh, our, the nature clean, it's uh, very important uh, to communicate not only to the customers but uh, even to our employees to train them uh, how to behave, how they can also uh, inform and uh, educate our customers. Uh, uh, and uh, to use uh, um, technology uh, to make the communication easier. It's now very easy to show the customers, uh, not only uh, by newsletters and our magazines that we are uh, uh, making for them um, regularly, but also uh, by the example how we are behaving in the marina, uh, how we are maintaining our uh, equipment and uh, our boats and uh, how they can also follow our example. Um, uh, also, I think uh, it's important, uh, speaking of construction and equipment and infrastructure, uh, we are using, uh, since, since the beginning, uh, for instance, uh, solar panels to uh, warm the water. We have uh, seven sanitary facilities, two restaurants and a few buildings so we can use the clean energy uh, to, to warm the water. Um, then secondly, we have uh, and we can, uh, we have, we are coming from a, such a sunny land in Croatia, we have such a lot of sun so we can put uh, on the roofs uh, power plants which we already have and uh, we are planning to do it much more. In our country is also um, a program that uh, gives the companies who want to uh, install uh, solar um, photovoltaic, solar power plants, uh, uh, there is a way to get a subvention of it. And uh, I think this is the, the good way. Um, speaking... Um, um, Further, uh, what is also possible to, to do um, to, um, to make the impact on the nature and envi environmental um, uh, to reduce it is to use technology, especially digitalization. Uh, we are really uh, trying to use as much as we can uh, in communication, but also uh, in preventing some uh, dangerous um, events that can happen such as fire, uh, which is very dangerous not only for the nature but also for the life, uh, then uh, we can use technology to prevent, for instance, uh, uh, splitting um, uh, the oil from the bilges into the sea. Um, and I'm happy to say we are using a kind of a system uh, with uh, sensors. Uh, sensors are also for long years uh, on boats and uh, in use and uh, mostly the systems are uh, done that they inform the boat owner or user directly but um, we made um, uh, we, we have a, a, I think a 
much better solutions because this system is uh, informing a marina directly that something is happening on the boat. For instance, if there is uh, smoke on the boat, uh, so we can prevent uh, spreading the fire much earlier than uh, before it spreads out. Or if the temperature in the engine room is uh, increasing, it's also an alert uh, to react. Or if the um, uh, bilge area is um, filling with water, so we get uh, the marina gets the alarm uh, as quickly as possible and can react. So uh, we have a lot of possibilities to improve our business and. Uh, make people happy, make our customers happy, but uh, also to reduce the impact on our environmental and uh, to operate sustainably. Also, uh, I would like to point out that a very important thing is to communicate with the local um, uh, city or with the the local commune? living around the marina. Uh, yeah, exactly, yes. I just wanted to yeah. ask what you mentioned about the the uh, the the fresh water coming yeah. into the salt water. Yeah. So what so what do you do as marina not to let it go in? Do you collect it from the boats or what? Yes, what is it's the system? a system. It's a technology that is uh, uh, constructed into uh, the the uh, marina and in the marina. Okay. Yes, across along the shore. So all the water goes goes first uh, through the separators and then the waste, uh, the hazardous waste. For instance, the oil and the remain of uh, of these things, uh, uh, which remain, they remain in the system, and only clean water is going into the sea. And this hazardous waste uh, is uh, then uh, um, uh, evidented. We have uh, evidence of it, and uh, we can give it only uh, to uh, authorized uh, companies who are dealing with the hazardous waste. Okay. So um, we collect uh, waste from the boats, uh, we recycle them, uh, we collect, it, collect uh, them also separately. So there are really many ways to, to act. Yeah. Uh, and what is also more important, uh, it's not only about uh, business and money, because we want to have it in the future for our children and grandchildren. Um, it's very important to, to uh, have a good communication with um, decision makers in politics, uh, to educate even them, and uh, with the institutions that are actually have to monitor and to make inspections, yeah. not only uh, in, for marinas and marina operators, but also customers, uh, the boaters. Uh, Their there has to be awareness yeah. that it's it's not only uh, um, dangerous to put uh, uh, plastic in the sea to leave it, uh, but it's also it can be also fined. So yes, yeah. inspections are necessary. Okay, and you have those as well. The uh, there are, but I, I would be happy to have them even more. Even more. We okay. are measuring uh, our um, uh, the quality of the sea in yeah. our marina for more than 40 years, always on the same spots. And uh, it's made by an authorized institute uh, where the biologists and chemists are. And uh, we, we have a good um, uh, track of uh, the quality of the water, how it was before and how is it now. How it is now. And so it's then, really good. Yeah, thank yeah. you. So I think I will link this to David, since you're a marine wit litter specialist. Um, what... Um, yeah, what's... Like, so that's one system that they have, but what are some systems... Uh, to stop marine litter uh, or that you that you have experienced or that you know of so yeah b before i start with the, with your question your your point i like to all uh, to invite everyone to hall 14 all, uh, as well we because we have a stand there and i think this is the perfect link to what we are talking about we have a um, build up a virtual reality for the north sea and the baltic sea and so ev everyone can experience the beauty of the nature and experience how how it can look like and what we want to protect here i think every one of us wants this and so therefore it's it's the perfect link um, to what we want to talk about it's it's how to prevent this. We work together with uh, in a project called Gewässerretter. It's the sea 
safers, protectors, um, with, um, the sp with um, big sports associations of the canoeing um, sports association, of the rowing sports association and the diving sports association together in this project because every one of these users has a huge interest to protect their, their own habitat the, where they work in, where they do their sports in. And therefore, as, as you mentioned, it's, it's everyone wants to keep it clean, wants to, doesn't want to have the litter in, in, in the ocean. I think the first, the first and most important point is what the professor already said, is that we need to focus on stopping the litter, and I would even get one step before it, before it exists, before it has been created, and not before it enters any, anywhere. Um, so therefore, I want to um, also link to, to your point that we need legislation. And now is the uh, UN um, Plastic Treaty coming up in the coming year, um, which is focusing on the whole life cycle of plastic production, from production to, um, to disposal or to recycling, and tries to um, tackle all those um, issues. And this is quite an, an important point, because um, mid marine litter um, in the sea um, that is coming from the shipping industry, that is coming from from um, use of the ocean, from the fishing industry, makes around about 10% of litter in the ocean, 10 to 20%. So we need to tackle but this. Could you say, what kind of litter are you talking about? Is it litter of dead fish or is it litter of the plastic or what, what kind of litter are you so talking it's, it's about? So it's pretty diverse. The, the litter, or, um, what we see in the, in the sea that is coming from the shipping and fishing industry is of course, nets, fishing net is one of the topics, but also um, on the, the, the loss of, um, of, um, container, of container ships. We have a project called Fishing for Litter, where we have um, implemented a return system of litter in German um, harbors, c working together with the fishing industry um, to get back their litter and um, bring it to to the um, to the recycling um, factories, etc. And um, we see um, in the North Sea from one container loss where approximately 30 containers got lost in the year 2016, we still see litter of this container which contains um, car um, 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 lights, which contains um, 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 clothes for, for children, and we see those litter coming up out of these containers still. So, so, so what you say, the container falls off the boat, yes. when it, it opens, it doesn't stay closed? Sometimes, sometimes it's open, it opens directly, sometimes it, it sank to the, to the ground, and over the time, it opens up. All the stuff starts and to all float the out. stuff gets out. Yeah. So therefore, um, addressing directly the port operator, operators, we need a higher education, a better controlling system to protect, because, I mean, also the containing ship industry is, has, has not an interest to lose their containers. So, but therefore, there needs to be more effort, more effort to be done to protect this and to have the control that this, uh, the, the, the containers are um, safely secured. For the um, small marinas, for example, we see from our experience that it's quite important to, uh, to do awareness raising. That's what you already said. To do awareness raising, and um, from my campaigning experience, you need to do it on different channels, digital, analog, talk to the people. And what is, from our experience, pretty important and, and helpful is to have a caretaker, to have one person in a harbor who's responsible for this topic and everyone could ask him without paying anything and just a helping hand to help so how to... Free advice. Uh, yes, yes, that is, that is so important because the people are traveling around the world and the, the regulations are everywhere different and we need someone who can help with this. And this is, this is an quite an Im important, important topic. And what, what can be done in the marinas or in the harbors is, for example, how 
um, the, the reduction of single-use plastic items. This is the one of the easiest and smallest steps, but everyone still uses it. Everyone wants his chewing gum, everyone wants his ice cream s packaged. Why not having unpacked um, ice cream there? I mean, that, that it's Frank, possible. We have that. Uh, Frank has a question for you. Yeah. <laughs> because... It's a remark, so we... Can, can you hear me? Yeah. At the moment, we, we are doing a, a European project called EnviroNode, also with the EBI. So we, we try to educate these caretakers in the marinas, and uh, we would love to have you as a partner in this project. So we are on the way to um, find, figure out people and to give them the opportunity to have this knowledge to help in the water sports industry. And just quickly, Renata, would, would you be able to afford a person like that, like a full-time person as a marina owner? Could you? We, uh, we have it already. Uh, okay. Nice to mention it because uh, we have our processes uh, uh, very well uh, maintained mm -hmm. and also certified but, uh, by uh, ESO uh, standards for uh, uh, managing the okay. environmental also by the TAIA project of Golden Scheme, and uh, we are going now to the Clean Marina uh, Scheme. Uh, and uh, we also have the Blue Flag, which was uh, the first Blue Flag in Croatia. I'm speaking in the name uh, of my marina because I know this the best. But I also know that a lot of marinas are making huge efforts uh, in this way uh, to raise the awareness uh, of the uh, behaving. Yeah. Uh, it's important uh, to show them uh, by our example how we are uh, taking care uh, about maintaining mostly. For instance, uh, we do not allow um, the maintaining of the ships to be uh, performed in the marina area. We have a special area in the shipyard, in the, we call it service zone, uh, where the ship can be maintained. Uh, and everything which comes uh, down on the marina premises uh, when it's washed and even where the, the place where the boats are washed is going through the filters. Okay. So we collect... Just a quick question. Yeah. Who, who uh, gives the blue, blue Flag Award? Is it a European or is it international? It's a European found uh, of uh, the, the Fee Foundation for the Environmental Education, okay. as far as I know. It's, and, uh, do you know European. about this? Or? Yes. Yeah, because we, um, we, with NABU, we are part of an advising committee with, uh, together with the government, um, and we wrote some parts of this advising for the blue flag okay. codes for the marinas, how to proceed with marine, marine litter. So, it, so to yeah. get the Blue Flag Award, you would have to have a person like that in the staff of the marina? Is that sort of... I'm actually not sure if, if the Blue Flag requires this. this no, but it's mostly uh, the harbour master, the marina yeah. captain, yeah. who is always on the premises. And uh, has the, to keep an the eye marineros on that. who are on the dock walk, they see everything what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. And they are uh, trained and educated uh, to react and uh, to show the customers uh, how, to, how they yeah. can behave. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We'll, we'll move on to Mike. <laughs> Mike, <laughs> um, so you definitely have a heart for uh, for the sharks and biodiversity. Yes, sure. um, so, um, so what what do you suggest? What can be done to to help in um, to protect them? What, okay. from the um, boating industry maybe or something. In the last minutes we have heard a lot about uh, reducing waste have a in little, the water. We, don't, we can go a little bit over time. I've been given permission. No, no problem for me. <laughs> 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 yeah, so that, that means in, in the past we have heard a lot of reducing the waste in the water and it's very important we have to reduce the plastic in the sea. We, we heard about solutions and uh, I do not really want to repeat all these things. No? I would yeah. only would like to point out uh, for example that the boating industry has to do a lot for the biodiversity, for the animals in the sea. For example, when you, everybody of us knows it, the, the consumption of, of the noise in the water, that whales, for example, dolphins and so on, they are not find the right way if they are swimming and, no? and all these things. So that means we need to have a solution for new technologies to reduce the consumption of noise in the water. And uh, we need to have new um, solutions for anchoring, for example. Yes, when, for example, some, some safari boats, ne? every diver is going to Egypt and you are driving to a coral reef and they are throwing away the anchor and the anchor is going directly into the corals, it makes no sense. So we need to have some solutions, some better solution for that. 
And do, do uh, they, is there already like a does an anchor exist that that give makes less damage? Is that already? Th there are some solutions uh, in the way that we have um, some some stones in the water where we can fix the anchor, for so example. Points, but but yeah. it's not. I see it very often when I go diving. Yeah? So, and the next thing, and what I see very often is that you are jumping in the water, you dive around, and when you are coming back, there are small things in the sea, and when you are take a deep look in that, you find out that it's the waste from the boat. That means the crew of the boat in the meantime throw away all the waste in the water, yeah? and as you as a diver pick it up when you are yeah. Go, go up. No? So and this is really absolutely horrible for all yeah. the seas. It must be really depressing. Yes. Yeah. So that means we have to protect the habitat of our animals in the water, every habitat. And this is very important for me and the boating industry have to take care for that. Have you to would think almost about think, it. you know, how like <clears throat> on the land, um, how if you see somebody doing something illegal as, as just a citizen of of Germany or whatever, you could you could tell the police about it, and you would say the same thing should be for divers. They should be able because they're the first people that see what's going wrong. That maybe they there should yeah. be like some kind of organization where you can actually yeah. um, hold hold somebody accountable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, but yes, I only talk about divers. I'm I'm pretty sure that not only divers have these problems. No? Well, just to see because you see it, you see it. But yeah, yes, we saw it. Yeah. I've, I've done films regarding that. Yeah, so, and yes, for me, boating industry have to think about all these things. Have to make new solutions for that. Yeah. And uh, I really don't know if the boating industry. I'm, I'm not so in in these things, but I'm, I'm coming from another business. Yeah. And uh, I think this cradle to cradle, for example, when we are talking about new boats, this is very important. Yeah, that that we have sustainability boats. Yeah, that means uh, every boat can. It's from, from, the, from the development of the boat until the boat is, gets broken. You yeah. have to yeah. reduce all these thing. We've things. Been, we've been talking about that um, uh, in the last panels, but it seems to be that there are, it's not that many, but there are boat, boat makers that are now really thinking about beginning to end yeah. of the life. Yeah, I know. So we quickly move on but, to Vanessa. But um, give, give me just one second, oh yeah. uh, because one thing was very important. Yeah, the, the guy next to me told me that they have a virtual reality thing from, from the North, from, North, from the, from yeah, the North, North Sea. Uh, it's, it's very fine. We have the same at our stand. It's uh, Hall 12, E41. Okay. We go diving with the children and with everybody. We have a 360 degrees diving spot. And uh, that's what we would like to do. We okay. want to bring the seat in mind of these children that everybody said, okay, this is very nice, very important to protect. Yeah, so you are invited. So, so you've brought the sea yes. to Hall 12. Yeah. Okay. Good. So then, whoever wants to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. So Vanessa, uh, your question is: since you came from um, the business and retail industry, and that, that's probably one of the reasons why you switched. Um, uh, what? Uh, what? How can you? Uh, advise industries on becoming more sustainable because people still want their fashion products, their retail, but what would be your advice since you kind of have a vision from both sides? Um, yes, so I mean we heard obviously a lot of terrible situations at the current stage and there still has to be done a lot but I would like to highlight however since we try to stay positive it is a really long fight. It is going to be a terrible fight and we need to stay positive and be happy about all the little steps and successes that happen in between to be able to really go through. Um, so I would like to highlight that there is, how, of, of course, however, things happening in the industries. Um, companies are getting more and more conscious about their environmental impact through so many different factors. Is it like from the end consumer or also uh, specific stakeholders? Um, but yeah, there's definitely still a lot to do. So um, I think one really impactful way how corporations can become more sustainable is definitely by partnering up with us, with NGOs. 
Um, and we think that uh, we at the Sea Cleaners believe that they can and they should be part of the solution. And um, I have to say that the biggest polluter at the end have also the biggest margin to develop in the right direction um, and have in that case also a true contribution or make a cr true contribution to, uh, to the environment in that case. Um, but to guarantee this, obviously, in, there has to be certain measurements that it won't be just empty words, but there will be actions from the corporation side as well. So when it comes to partnerships with our um, organization, for example, we set in place a partnership policy where corporations commit to, first of all, uh, make efforts to reduce their environmental footprint, especially when it comes to plastic pollution. We have heard a lot of different data, but I would like to highlight why we focus so much on, um, on plastic pollution is because 85% um, of marine waste is unfortunately plastic, so this is why we're focusing on it. We, um, corporations also commit to raise awareness um, with their internal stakeholders among the external stakeholders such as employees, um, and consumers, um, suppliers, etc., to really talk about these environmental issues and especially plastic pollution in the ocean. Uh, and of course, what is also really important is that they support our projects. We work, as I mentioned before, for example, on the Manta, which is our flagship project, which is going to be a gigantic green and smart ship, which is going to cost around uh, 40 million euros. So this is definitely even just cost-wise a really ambitious, ambitious project. Um, we already collected some uh, a good portion of funds, but we are definitely still in the fundraising phase at the current stage. So, Could you say the name of that project again? It's called the Manta, the Manta Project. Manta, as in manta ray. In the manta ray. So our inspiration comes from the ray family. Okay, so if you are a company and that's wondering how can I, can I help or already be part of one of these NGOs, we can say manta would be a good place to start. Exactly, 100%. Okay, okay. Yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, th yeah. Thank you for mentioning that because I, I probably a lot of companies are like, well, we don't know exactly where to start, but maybe it would start with a co with a conversation, of course. So finally, Frank. Um, so you have this amazing research ship, uh, and I don't know how to say to pronounce the name. Uh, Aldebaran. It's like the star in Taurus in the star sign. Ah, of Taurus. Okay, okay. I'm a Taurus, and you have to be a Taurus. So you're actually an astronomer. Like yeah, yeah. Hmm? You're actually an astronomer. Yeah. Uh, or an, uh, not an astrologer. Um, okay, so with this boat, you've probably done a lot of research. And uh, so could you say some of the things that you've seen and uh, from the research from the boat and what are some changes that you think could be made besides what we've all been saying long-term and short-term? Is there something we could do right now or... Yeah, so um, we are operating this vessel since 30 years and I'm diving even longer and um, the, the oceans are changing dramatically. So when I talked to Franz uh, two, three weeks ago, he told me that, uh, for example, the temperature change in the sea, maybe below 30 meters, is more or around 10 degrees. So this is like... 10 degrees warmer in 30 years. 10 no, in, in, in 30 meters, constantly. Um, and if you make a comparison with humans, if you have a temperature, temperature, normal temperature of 37 degrees, and you have 10 degrees more, it means that you will die. And all the sponges already died, maybe you can uh, tell later. And um, for example, a second um, thing is that a lot of species disappear. We had a nice talk about Pina nobilis. This is an amazing mussel, uh, more than one meter long, long in the in Croatian area. And I, I can remember when I dived there 20 years ago, uh, 30 years ago, a lot of these mussels have been there and they are short bef before extinction. 
and we want to go there and help with communication, help with documentation um, to save this um, um, this species. So and. Um, Everybody is talking about the plastic issue. This is important, this is visible, but uh, the, the loss of biodiversity is much more, um, is even bigger, and also the acidification um, coming from climate change, from the CO2, um, um, uh, from the CO2 concentration in the air. So we are faced with a lot of things and we don't react, we humans don't react, and this is really sad. And I think that the uh, water sport industry and community, we are so close uh, to our waters and oceans, so Franz already mentioned, it's not only the oceans, it's everything below water is responsible. I think 99% of all the species in the world are living in water. So we have to t take care more about this and put the focus. And I'm so very happy that we are here on this uh, panel, but also that we have the Love Your Ocean initiative since six years to bring together industry, society, and uh, science to, to try to solve these things. And um, beside this, we are also awarding uh, the Ocean Tribute Award and we already had some discussions about the end of um, life cycle with all this mass of plastic in the, in the boating industry. And we awarded uh, a company uh, based in France, the, 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 the couple is coming from Austria, and they try to make the first recyclable catamaran. So the cradle-to-cradle -cradle principle um, is very important. And um, at the end, the capacity of, the, of our globe is limited. So if we learn quick how to close the cycles, we will survive. If we don't learn, we, um, we will disappear from this earth. And plastic basically is not a bad material, but it is bad if you use it like now to waste it and to dump it and to burn it. This is impossible. So what you're saying is that um that may be even worse than plastic is the temperature change in the water yeah. and the acidity. Yeah. That is worse. The ca coming back to your question, so we did uh, some expeditions in the, in the Caribbean uh, because we wanted to visualize climate change. We did it with the second uh, German TV program and <clears throat> it's amazing. So these corals are very fragile, a uh, fragile ecosystem. And when the temperature is, away, uh, is, is too high, or if there is too much acidification, they die, and then they die forever. So it's very, very complicated. A lot of NGOs try to make coral reef restoration, but it's not possible. So it's also not possible to take out all the plastics from, from the ocean. We have to start at the beginning. We have to um, find new designs, and we really have to, um, to execute the energy... Um, the renewable energy transmission as soon as possible. And I think this incredible war, we should more use to be independent. And for example, solar energy is the cheapest and the best and renewable energy we have. And I'm happy to hear that, uh, for example, a lot of marinas um, want to use it and everybody of us should use it, not only on the boat, also at home. So if people ask me, what can we do for our oceans? is to put your own solar panel on your roof, wherever it is one square meter or two or, uh, two or 17. Yeah. Just use le using, finding ways to use less energy. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, Professor, do you have any, um, like I find, I also find that if you give me the example of this giant uh, shell, that now I can no longer see it because it's extinct, that's like a tragedy. Like, is there, is there anything that you also are seeing? Um. Yeah. What I would like to point out is, uh, as Frank mentioned, there is loss of biodiversity. But nobody could imagine 10 years before how fast these are going. So we lost the muscle, Frank mentioned, the Pina nobilis, uh, during the last five years. Lost it m 
I think we have lost it in the Mediterranean Sea. Maybe there are two or three spots there that they survived, but we have lost it. And the other example we are seeing at the moment, and this is really a privilege for the divers, yeah, if you are going to Lake Constance and you know it for five or six years, it's completely different. And this is one species, this is one mussel put in, maybe by a boat, attached to a boat, and now the Lake Constance ecosystem is completely changing. And the impact for the biodiversity, for the system, is one on the one hand, and the other thing is that the impact on economy is that high that the drinking water of Stuttgart, where we are living, is now increasing. The reason is this small muscle is overgrowing everything, even the, the pipelines for the drinking water, so they have to build a new drinking water system, completely new one, to filter out the larvae of this mussel. Because the invasive species right. destroyed it. N not really destroyed it, it's overgrown everything, and it's possible with, uh, uh, from his biology, there's no time for, to go for the, in the details, um, overgrown everything. Uh, and it, you only see, if you're going diving at the moment in the Lake Constance, you only see this mussel. So it's also, uh, destroying the habitats for the native species. So th this is, as I mentioned, it's unbelievable how fast these are going. And there's no time to wait for something, to wait for a solution. Yeah. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have to prevent such things. Yeah. And uh, there was uh, mentioned the legislation. There are already an, a code of contact for uh, these invasive species, there is uh, a management plan for handling the ballast water. Yeah. But it happened once five again, years ago, yeah. five years ago in the Lake Constance. I just want to ask Jorge, when you, when you hear these things, um, does it make you, will you go back, since you are in a position that you can speak with, with the industry, will you go back and say, uh, these are the things that I've heard, does that m make you maybe more... Uh, even if it's not by law, will you try and make your company more sustainable? Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, that's uh, not just, uh, I think, my task to do this. This is our common task to do this, to, to approach uh, uh, people from the industry, from the politics, and, and really mention this uh, uh, to them. And uh, what has already been mentioned a couple of times, we have to start with ourselves. Yeah, with our selves thinking, with our selves behavior. Yeah, because we are the masses. Yeah, and uh, even though maybe just a, a million people think in that way, there's a billion people throwing pollution in the world. Yeah, and and that is the big issue. So we are the masses, and I think we can bring this out to to the other masses. So we have to clean our, let's say, our house first before throwing fingers or putting, pu pointing fingers to, to others. Yeah? Uh, and, and obviously, industry has to do something. Uh, uh, they are always looking for, for options, uh, what they can do as long as they can earn money with that. Yeah? And of course, uh, even if they don't earn additional money with that, that would be a fortune for all of us. Yeah? Um, it, it's Let me difficult. just, uh, David, did you want to say something? Um, I, I partly agree. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, yes, everyone has to do his homework. Um, but on the other hand, we, we talk about life cycles, and life cycles starts with a production, and companies are producing. So we need to consider the whole life cycle and not only our CO2 footprint while producing. We need to include what happens afterwards. We need to include everything what, what, what's involved with our product we, 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 we produce. And this is something that needs to be transparent and this is something where the consumer can't see this and this is something the industry 
can provide and the industry has to provide because the customers, they only want that. They're only they searching for sustainable solutions and they want to implement this. And to round it a little bit up with a um, um, yeah, We have like two more minutes. And then okay, CO2, <laughs> CO2 emissions. The plastic producing industry is producing CO2 emissions. They use um, fossil, fossil fuel. So they are a big player in this whole, whole, whole um, scenario. And therefore, not only the plastic items that we see in the, in the, in the ocean, but also just the whole industry and the whole cycle Products around it you buy, is yeah. involved into the um, climate crisis and therefore also involved into um, the biodiversity crisis we are in. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, I, th I would invite everyone, if you want, to come over and uh, talk to some of these people. And I would also, uh, I really like your suggestion, because of course, maybe you're a company and you're making uh, like some kind of diving equipment and you don't really know what to do, is to go and talk to people like you guys and, um, and maybe partner up like what you mentioned. Um, yeah. yeah, definitely. I think especially... What we, are, what we are doing or even other boats, it is there's so much expertise and also materials needed where especially the boating industry can, can come in and come and be part of really sustainable solutions. Yeah. And I think what I've noticed walking around, because I, have a, I actually have my backpack full of materials, so I, I, I'm going and I'm like, you know, you could make that out of flax. And they're like, what are you talking about? So it's almost like they don't even know that certain materials would be an alternative to plastics without any like huge extra costs. But OK, so thank you so much. Amazing panel. Um, we will uh, be back here on the stage tomorrow uh, talking with, with really the end user. Um, so I will definitely tell them some of the things that you've told me and we can we are all advised to visit the, the shark tank <laughs> in hall hall uh, 12 hall e 12 E41 okay 12 E41 and then the, the love your ocean is in it's in 14 A14 but it's in the middle of 14 yeah, in hall 14 inflatable whale and around are all the initiatives okay all right Grazie mille. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.